Well, welcome to Trailhead Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us and worship with us this weekend. Um, I hope that God will truly speak to you as he has been speaking to you through the music. I hope that he will continue to do that as we open God's word together today. We are starting a new series today and to just jump in and dive in, uh, I thought I would share a, a little personal story. Um, when I became a dad, I thought, you know, one of my jobs as a dad is to help my kids experience adventure. I don't know if, uh, if you're a dad, if that would be on your list of things that you want to do with your kids, but I, I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie. I love roller coasters and anything that's falling out of the sky at a fast rate of speed, that kind of stuff excites me. And I, I thought, you know, I, I need to instill some of that in my kids. And so when our first daughter was born, Reagan, um, she came into the world and, and quickly got got to be a big girl. I mean, so big that she couldn't crawl. She had to roll instead. Uh, and, and so as she was at that stage of life, while she was still really young, I remember there were times I would take her in my hands and, and like many dads or moms do, I would kind of toss her up in the air, not even letting her get beyond the reach of my hands, not truly tossing her, but throw her up in the air in this way and, and bring her back down. And when I did that with Reagan. She started laughing and it made her excited and it was one of those things in that moment that I knew, okay, this child is going to have my sense of adventure because she liked it from the very beginning. And then our second daughter, Heidi, came along. And as Heidi came along, um, Heidi wasn't quite as hefty as her older sister. Um, and Heidi also was not quite as adventurous as her older sister. And so I would do the same with Heidi. I would take her in my hands and I would toss her just slightly out of my hands. And as I would do that with Heidi, um, she would get this look of death on her face. Her hands would go up and her fingers would spread all the way out. And in just a matter of a second or two after coming back down, she would make this face and just start crying her eyes out. And it was obvious from that moment that I first did that with her that she did not come into the world with the same sense of adventure um, that her older sister had come into the world with. You know, it's funny that all of us, even, even those of us who have the same DNA to some degree as another person in our family, we are not wired exactly the same. In fact, those two uh, examples show you that even two children of mine, one of them loves risk, one of them loves adventure, one of them would not step into risk and adventure if their life depended on it. And, and that's just the way that they have been wired from birth. Well, like I mentioned a minute ago, we are starting a new series that we are calling Risky Business. And we're talking about the place where comfort comfort and faith collide. Uh, and, and this happens for all of us in life. It, it, whether you have recognized it or not, whether you've stopped back to pay attention to this or not, you, you probably intuitively know that every one of us are managers of risk. Every one of us have to deal with risk on a regular basis. And some people excel at that and love that. And some people really bring their tolerance down and they don't want to step into risk uh, as much. Uh, one way that you can see this is you can see it in the way that we handle finances, yeah, right? You can see it in the way that some people take their money and, and they may be saving up for retirement and they will put it in a 401k or they'll put it in some sort of uh, account that's connected to the stock market and immediately they go and they say, I want uh, the greatest possible reward, which means I know I'm going to be taking the greatest possible risk. And they put it there and they don't think about it again and they just sit on it and let it do whatever it's going to do. And it doesn't bother them at all to have risk in their finances. Then there are other people that look at the stock market and they get just a little bit queasy thinking about about the stock market. They would never put money in the stock market. They, they stick with CDs. Um, if they really venture out, uh, maybe they will step into a mutual fund or something like that. Um, but they are really averse to risk and don't want to step into risk. And, and then there are those people 
that look up uh, maybe a little bit like me and say, yeah, I've got $5 in my bank account. <laughs> and so that whole discussion is a different discussion, right? At that point, you're not worried about the risk of the stock market. You're kind of worried about the risk of, all right, do I take this out and buy the Chick-fil-A milkshake today um, and risk our bank account being overdrawn tomorrow if a bill comes through? Or, or do I leave it in there and play it safe? That's, uh, that's really where it comes down for a lot of people today. Um, along those same lines, if you have ever been in any type of relationship, you know that you have been in situations of risk. If you have ever asked someone out on a date, it was a risky thing that you did. And you may have felt that very much so in your gut, in your stomach, with the butterflies that were uh, twitching within you. If you have ever said yes to going out on, to, uh, on a date with someone, you took a risk, and you didn't know how this was going to turn out. You didn't know what was going to uh, come of the night that you would spend with this person, and you stepped into a risk. In the same way, maybe one step further, if you have ever said yes in marriage to someone, not knowing what their emotional health would be 20 years down the road, not knowing what their physical health would be 10 years down the road, or not knowing um, what, what they would be doing with their lives in 10 or 15 years, you know what it means to take a risk. Every one of us do this in different situations in life. Every one of us take risk in different ways. And, and again, if you are a parent, you know what it is to take a risk. Maybe you didn't understand it when you were becoming a parent. But, but when you become a parent, you are saying, I am attaching my life to this child for the rest of my life. Whether they come out acting like me or they come out acting like my spouse or whether they come out acting totally different than either, either one of us. Whether they have the same mentality about life as I do or not, I am attaching myself to them for life. It is a huge risk risk that we take when we become parents. If you've shared your emotions and feelings with someone, if you've ever taken a job and you just weren't sure if this was the right fit for you, you know what it is to take a risk. Risk is part of our everyday lives. Every single one of us deal with this thing called risk and we deal with it in different ways. Like, like we've said, some people jump in head first and some people hold back and say, uh, don't know if I am ready to do this that yet. Well, in the same way, what you're going to see over the next several weeks is that this whole idea of faith, this whole idea of relating to God and connecting to God is a huge deal of risk. That's what we're talking about when we say risky business where comfort and faith collide. That's what we are going to be looking at in different ways over the next few weeks. But the reality is if you read scripture, if you go through the Bible, one of the things that you're going to find out is you cannot do a relationship with God apart from risk. And in fact, you, you know that intuitively because there is risk on the front end of this whole idea of faith, right? If you come to a place of faith where you say, I'm going to start following God. I'm going to start listening to God. I'm going to start attending a church. You've already made a statement of risk. You've said, even though I have probably never seen God with my eyes, even though I've never heard him with my ears, I am going to step in and at least base part of my life around this idea of faith. Well, all through scripture, we see how risk and faith come in and play together. We see where comfort and faith collide at different times. And so like I said, over the next several weeks, we're going to see just how important this idea of risk is in our relationship with God. Today, as we do that, we're going to be looking at a story that actually is a proven story. We're taking the risk out for you, all right? So if you're not um, very tolerant of risk, we're looking at a story that has been been around for 2,900 years. A story that is proven, a story that has helped many people understand God and grow in their faith. And the story is a story about a guy named Elijah. 
Elijah is a prophet, meaning he hears from God and speaks for God. Sometimes that's about the future. Most of the time it's just about what's going on in his day right then. But Elijah is dealing with a, another guy who's a really important figure named Ahab. Ahab was the king of Israel during this time, and he was not a good guy. <laughs> in fact, he married a woman that just kind of shows his character as well. He married a woman named Jezebel. Uh, even if you have not heard of Jezebel in the Bible before, chances are you did not name your kids Jezebel, right? And the reason that we don't name our kids or our daughters Jezebel is because she was not a good person. She's not one that we want to follow in her footsteps, right? And so Ahab and Jezebel are the king and queen of Israel, and Elijah is the prophet that is dealing with them, interacting with them. And as we walk through this passage in 1 Kings chapter 17, what you're going to see is there is this series of things that happens where faith and comfort continually collide. In fact, there's a pattern that I want you to look for in this passage where three times the same thing is going to occur over and over and over. And I think it is happening that way to teach us an incredibly important lesson about the way that we handle risk when it comes to to following God. So let's just jump in and read the story together. In 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1 it says this, Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. If you just take that verse and pull it out and look at it by itself, it, it sounds almost arrogant on Elijah's part where he's come to this place that he pronounces to the king, it's not going to rain again until I say it's going to rain again. Actually, what's happening is Elijah's not proclaiming to be God here. He's not stepping in and saying the rain obeys me. He is, like I mentioned a moment ago, he's a prophet and he has heard from God. God said to him, you tell Ahab. I am not going to cause it to rain again until I tell you it is going to rain again. Here's what's happening in this scenario. Like I mentioned, Ahab was married to this woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel was from a town, a city called Sidon. Uh, that was almost like a capital city, if you, if you want to think of it in that way, uh, for the, the god Baal. Uh, that, that was a place where God, the god Baal was worshipped and extolled and everyone in the town thought highly of this local god. Uh, Baal was the god of fertility. And what that means is not only was he the god of fertility in human beings, but he was the god of the fertility of the land. So he was also thought of as the god who brings the rain, who causes the storm. And in this case, particularly because Ahab and Jezebel are chasing after this god Baal, the living god comes to Elijah and says, I'm going to show Ahab who is truly the God of the rain, who is truly the God of fertility. And so he says to Elijah, you tell Ahab that there's not going to be any rain or dew or any moisture in this land at all until I give the word. And so that's exactly what Elijah does. He goes and speaks to the most powerful man in the land at that time, the king of the nation of Israel, and says, until I tell you that God has said it's coming, you're not going to see any more rain or any more dew in this land. As we go on in verse 2, it says something that I think is really telling. And you're going to see this more than once in this passage. It says this, then the Lord said to Elijah, said that um, it, it gives us this indication that God is talking to Elijah in this time. You may look at that and think, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I've ever heard God talk to me. I'm not sure I've ever heard God lead me or direct me. But I think this passage is really hammering this point because it wants us to know that God does talk to people. He talks to people just like me and just like you. In fact, I would dare say that God wants to speak to me and wants to speak to you every single day. The question is, are we ready and willing to listen to what he has to say? 
you know, a lot of times our problem in this communication thing with God is that we come to God and we just basically tell him what we want or tell him what we need. And so we say, God, uh, look, hey, if you could just help me out in this situation or if you would just do this for me, then I could do what I really need to do. Or God, if you would just be so gracious as to forgive me for the things that I've done. And that's generally the way that we come to God. We come and we say, I need you to do this. I want you to take care of this. I hope that you will do this for me. All right. Let me just ask you a quick question. If you're married um, or, or even if you're in a dating relationship, how well will your relationship go or your marriage go if the only thing that you do when you talk to your spouse or the person that you're dating is say, I need you to do, I want you to take care of, I hope that you will do this, um, and, and just forgive me for the ways that I've hurt you today. It probably wouldn't go well, right? If the only thing that you say to your spouse is, I need you to take care of the dishes, um, that's probably not going to be a very productive conversation. If the only thing that you do when you come to them is say, I, I really want you to get out of my space because I've got some things that I want to take care of here, it's probably not going to go well. You need interaction. You need to talk with them, not just to them if the relationship is going to work. And in the case with God, it is exactly the same. It's this deal where if we want to hear from God, he, he's ready to speak to us, but we have to be willing to hear what he wants to say rather than just tell him what we want to say. In fact, there's a guy named uh, George Mueller who really kind of introduced our world in the last 150 years or so to the power of prayer. And what George Mueller says is this. He says, I seek at the very beginning. So in other words, as he's coming to pray, before he ever says a word, he says, I seek at the very beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. He says nine-tenths of our problem is right here in terms of prayer. Uh, the, the whole idea that we come and we tell rather than coming and connecting. The whole idea that we come and, and we just say, God, will you do? Rather than coming and saying, God, I want you to tell me how to pray. Think about it in these terms. Imagine you're going to meet with a friend um, or, or someone that you need to have an important conversation with. And as you're going to, to meet with them, you, you just stop and you pray for a minute. Uh, what is your typical prayer in that moment? Typically, our prayer is something like, God, will you take care of this? Will you make this work? Will you help this go the right way? Um, God, will you help them to see my point of view and understand what I'm saying here? Uh, but what if instead of doing that, we can't and said, God, I just want to come and ask that you would take my emotion and my will out of this. Because I don't want to do what seems logical to me. I want to do what you are telling me to do. That's what George Mueller says we need to do. If we truly want to call him God, we need to listen to him for direction rather than just tell him what we want. And so Elijah has come to the place in life where he has decided, I am going to come and I'm just going to listen. And sometimes what God says may scare me to death, like talking to the king of Israel and telling him that I am going to challenge his God or the God of his wife. It may scare me to death, but if God says to do it, I'm going to do it. And that's what's happening here. Again, God comes to Elijah a second time. And so you're starting to see the pattern here. God comes to Elijah and the Lord speaks to him. Going on in verse 3, it tells us what God said to Elijah. It says, go to the east. Again, God speaking to Elijah, go to the east and hide by the Kirith brook near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook. And eat what the ravens bring you, for I've commanded them to bring you food. <laughs> this is a, a pretty fascinating verse, a couple of verses here. So he, he says something that I think you need to, to recognize and pay attention to. He says, 
go to this brook. So go to go out in the wilderness. And, and essentially what he's telling him is he's saying, run and hide. Because you have told them that you are challenging the God Baal. And it's not going to rain anymore until the living God says it does. He says, they are wanting to come after you. They are wanting to take your life. So run and hide. And, and if you're Elijah, you probably think that's, that's good advice, God. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. But he, he tells him, don't just go hide anywhere. Go hide in the wilderness, away from people. And he says, as you do that, I'm going to feed you and give you water. I'm going to give you water from the brook. And every single day, I'm going to have ravens bring you food. I don't know if you've ever stopped to process this. Even if you've been around the church your whole life, you've probably heard this story a number of times, but I don't know if you've ever stopped to process the, the idea of ravens bringing you food. Um, let me just ask you a quick question. Where, where do ravens get most of their food? Yeah, in our day, it's roadkill. <laughs> and so I don't know as Elijah that that's a really exciting thing to hear that ravens are going to be bringing you meat a, a couple of times a day. But, but that's what God says. He, he says, I want you to go out into the wilderness. And the way that I'm going to feed you is I'm going to have uh, these ravens bring you food twice a day. And I'm going to let you drink from the water of the brook. And, and so what God has done here is he has said, first of all, to Elijah, he's spoken to him and he said, I want you to do something risky in telling the king of this nation that the living God is opposed to him right now. And then he comes along and he says, uh, on a second time, he says to Elijah, I want you to do something. I want you to go out and live far away from grocery stores, live far away from restaurants, live far away from people that would invite you into their home. I want you to go and just trust that I am going to feed you even in the middle of this drought and this famine. And so he says, I want you to take a risk and that you trust me and go out to this brook where I am going to take care of you. Going on, the, the next verse, in verse 5, it says this. So Elijah did as the Lord told him. That, that's just the beginning of the verse, but it helps you see the pattern, right? The pattern is emerging where God speaks, Elijah listens. After Elijah listens, he goes and he does exactly what God had told him to do. No matter how risky it felt, no matter how hard it seemed, no matter how illogical it looked in the moment, Elijah hears the word of God and he steps out and goes and does exactly what God said. That, that brings us to what I think is the big idea of this whole passage and, and that is this, you'll never know how good God is until you trust how right he is. Let that sink in because it's so critical to faith. You'll never know how good God is until you trust how right he is. Elijah has come to this place where as God speaks to him, not only does he listen and say, okay, God, whatever you say here, not my will, but your be do yours be done. He also has come to the place where he just trusts absolutely. If God says to do it, it is going to be right because God proves over and over and over that his word is true, that he carries out what he has told me. To do. Going on in verse 5, um, it says this, So Elijah did as the Lord told him, and camped beside the Kareth brook east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. Verse 7 says this, But after a while the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. And finally, in verse 8, we get back to the beginning of the pattern, and it says this, Then the Lord said to Elijah, exactly the same verse as we saw in verse 2, the same wording, same everything. The pattern is just starting over again. It says that God speaks, Elijah listens, Elijah does, and God shows his goodness as Elijah follows him in that moment. And so now as the brook begins to dry up because the drought has gotten so bad, 
God speaks again to Elijah and he says something new to him. Listen to what he says in verse 9. It says, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow, widow there to feed you two really important things in this verse. First of all, I don't know if you recognize the name Sidon, but just a minute ago I told you that the queen of Israel, Jezebel, was from this city of Sidon. Remember why God told him run and hide. They are coming to look for you. They want to kill you because you are challenging their God, Baal, right? At this point when God speaks to him, he doesn't say stay in hiding. I'm going to keep you in the wilderness. He says, no, no, no. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go right to the edge of the town, where Baal is revered, where the queen is from. I want you to reside in the middle of the place where these people are looking for you to take your life. Not a real comfortable thing, right? I mean, it's kind of hard to be in Elijah's shoes where you come to a place where you say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And then he says, okay, if you're going to trust me, then go right into the heart of enemy territory and just make your home there. Not only does he say that, but he says, the way that I'm going to take care of you is through a widow. I'm going to take care of you through the most vulnerable person in the entire society. If you paid attention to the history, if you know much of the history of scripture, you know that widows were the most vulnerable women or the most vulnerable people in all of society because they didn't have their husband to provide for them. At this time, women didn't do any type of education, so they didn't have a way to provide for themselves. Many times, um, women at this stage of life would become beggars or they, they may go into the fields behind the workers and pick up the scraps that were left behind in the fields as the workers cleaned the fields. And so God says to Elijah, the way I'm going to take care of you is through a widow in the middle of enemy territory. And then look at what he says. Um, if we go back to verse 9 quickly, what he says is, I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So if you're paying attention to this pattern, you might recognize that all of a sudden the pattern is about to start again, but God is pulling in another person into the same pattern. He says, I have spoken to a widow about caring for you and taking care of you. So going into verse 10, this is what it says. So he went to Zarephath. <laughs> Again, I love that. God speaks. Elijah listens. Even though this doesn't seem good to him, even though this seems incredibly risky, he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked, would you pre please bring me a little water in a cup. That sounds like uh, not a big deal because they live close to the Mediterranean. There was water available. It says as she was going to get it, he called to her. Kind of stopped her as she's going. Says, hey, hey, one more thing. Quick, a quick question for you. As you're getting me some water, will you also bring me a bite of bread too? Um, and then what we see in verse 12, uh, maybe one of the saddest, most pathetic verses in all of scripture as this widow turns around to speak to Elijah. She said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I kind of have a feeling that this woman knew this was coming, right? Because it says that God had told her, I'm going to send you someone who is from me and you need to be his provider. You need to give him bread. You need to give him food. And this woman is looking up and, and you'll see in a second that she has a son as well. She's looking up and she's saying, how can I do this, God? <laughs> You're telling me to step out in faith. You're telling me to provide for this man. And I have nothing myself. And all of a sudden, the man shows up and says, hey, can you get me a glass of water and, and give me a bite of bread as well? And she turns around and she just says, I've got nothing. <laughs> I know that God sent you here because he told me to take care of you, but I've got nothing. She goes on to explain that further, and she says, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil 
in the bottom of the jug. Um, I, I went today into our pantry and grabbed a couple of jars and I, I literally, my family won't be excited to hear this, but I literally just put my hand in the flour and got as big of a handful as I could get to put in this jar. As she says that she only had a handful of flour left in the world. She only had a, a little bit of oil left in her pantry. Can you imagine being at the place where you have to care for not only yourself, but your son as well, your child as well. And this is all you have in the world. A little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. And she is just feeling desperately at the end of her rope. She is saying to God, God, you are calling me to this incredibly hard thing. I don't know how I can provide. I don't know how I can help. I don't know how I can take care of this man that you're sending my way. In fact, the last part of this verse uh, is maybe the saddest part of this. She said, I, I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. <laughs> In other words, she says, we have struggled to hold on to this, and now we're at the point where this is it. We know we have one meal left. I'm gathering some firewood, and after we eat this meal, we will just starve to death incredibly sad situation that she's going through. You would think that Elijah would back up and say, no, 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 okay, look, if that's all you've got, then I am not going to take that. But that is not what he says. In fact, listen to what he says in verse 14 or 13. He says, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. So the, the first thing that he says to her is not, oh, you keep it for yourself. It's don't be afraid. And, and I think that's huge. I think that's so critically important in this moment because I would dare say to you that it may be your fear that keeps you from experiencing exactly what God wants you to experience. It may be your fear of taking a risk. It may be your fear of stepping out on faith. It may be your fear of initiating a conversation that prevents you from experiencing the goodness of God. The way that God wants you to experience it. And so Elijah stops this widow and he says, look... I've been through this pattern. I know how it works. God speaks and it's risky and I don't like it, but I step in and do it. And when I do it, it's amazing how he shows his goodness and his grace through that. Uh, so going on, it says, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow Again, verse 15 says, so she did as Elijah said. You see, again, the pattern. God says to her, I want you to be the provider. I want you to take care of this man. It feels risky. It feels hard. It feels like there's no way that she can do it. And after God says that to her, Elijah comes along and says, you just feed me first. Give me a piece of bread first, and then you make a meal for yourself. I know you only have a little bit, but God is going to make it work. God is going to take care of you. So she did as Elijah had told her, she did as God told her. She stepped in. She took a risk. She came to this place where her comfort and her faith were colliding. And she decided to let faith win over her comfort. Says, so she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family and I don't know exactly what that means. Um, maybe that just means she and her son. But, but it almost sounds bigger. Like other members of her family needed provision as well. And they were able to come get provision. So she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many 
days. Finally, the last verse in this passage, verse 16 says, there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Guys, the pattern is shown over and over and over because God wants us to get this. This is so critically important. God speaks. He is speaking to you. He will speak to you today. The question is, are you ready to listen Not to direct, not to instruct, but to listen to what God is saying. Even if it is risky, even if it is hard. And after the person hears God, it says in each one of these cases, they stepped in and did it. Even though it was frightening, even though it was scary, even though it was a risk. And every single time, the goodness of God was shown in a new, remarkable way. That's why I say to you, you will never understand the goodness of God until you trust how right he is. You will never experience and feel the blessing of God until you step in and trust what he is saying to do. Like I mentioned to you right at the beginning of this time, um, we as a church body are stepping into something new, stepping into something that's a little bit scary. We're stepping into a new facility, into a new building in the next couple of months. Um, I have a picture of the building just to show you again, to remind you of where it is and what it looks like. Um, As we step into this building, I have to tell you that there have been plenty of moments where we've had conversations around this, where we've talked to the owner of the building, and and I have not felt this overwhelming confidence of, oh, we're going to conquer this, but I've felt uh, incredible fear of, God, how does this work? In fact, if you look at what our expenses are every single month right now, um, our expenses in terms of facilities are not going to double. In fact, they are going to be five times greater every single month as we move into this new facility. And I have to tell you as a leader, if you don't look at those kind of numbers with some fear and trembling, something is wrong with you, right? But God has consistently, not only in his word, but through prayer and even dreams come to us and said, I want you to do this. I want you to step in with me and be a part of this. It is scary. It feels risky. But even at that, God has given us incredible grace and that he is providing three businesses in addition to Trailhead Church that will be paying for the space. And so as it works out, the church portion may actually be lower than what we are paying on a monthly basis right now. Uh, So God is doing what only God can do. He is doing this incredible work where he is saying to us as a church community, I want you to step out on faith. Is it risky? Yeah, it seems incredibly risky. Does it feel hard? It can feel hard, but I want you to step out on faith. And as you do that, you will experience my goodness in a way that you never dreamed you would experience my goodness. Guys, that's what's happening corporately, but let me just bring it home. Let me just ask you personally, what is God saying to you right now? What what is that thing that you felt that God was saying to you, but you just kind of pushed it off and, and you backed up and you said, God, that's just too much. That's beyond me. That's beyond what I can do. And so you've just kind of distanced yourself from that. What is it that God is calling you to do that feels risky right now? Here's my encouragement to you. I would just say two things and I would say them very simply. First is this. Listen with no will of your own, with no agenda of your own. Listen to what God is saying. And secondly, I would say... Go and do it. 
as God is calling you to do, as God is calling you to speak, as God is calling you to step in, go do it. Some of you say, yes, absolutely. I love this stuff. I love stepping into the risk with God. Some of you say, I cannot stand the thought of risk. And this is so incredibly hard. Even so, here's what I hope you will find. I hope that you will take one step to say, God, it is hard, but I am going to do it. One step at a time, I'm going to step in with you and do what you have asked me to do. And here is the promise that I think you see throughout Scripture related to this. You'll never truly know how good God is until you truly trust how right he is. Will you let that just sink into your heart and your life today? Start living with him by faith and you will experience the goodness of God. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we just admit this is hard for us. There are days where we, we feel charged up and we feel like we can step in and we can follow you anywhere. And then there are days where we, we just feel like there's no way we can do this. And so I ask you, God, to give us the boldness, give us the strength, give us the help that we need to take the risks that you are calling us to take. Father, we don't want to be foolish. We don't want to take risks just for the sake of taking risks. But God, we know that as you call us to do hard things, your way is always right. Give us the faith to know that, to step into that, and to follow you. We pray these things in the power of your awesome name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being a part of Trailhead this weekend. Um, as we get closer and closer to moving into the new building, I will give you more updates and let you know more of what to expect. If you are physically able and want to, we are worshiping now on Sunday mornings at 1030 in our parking lot. Come out and join us. Be a part of what God is doing and enjoy the community again of Trailhead Church. Thank you for being a part of Trailhead. We look forward to seeing you again soon.